This is the second video of the foot and ankle, and this is the eighth video in the uh, module four series, second to the end. Um, so this is basing. This is going to be based off of the information we got from the previous um, seminar or lecture on the uh, structure of the joint, particularly the relationship between the tibia, the fibula, and then the ankle, and then the other joints that are there. And we're going to be starting to look at the at the movements that are involved. <coughs> um, so uh, again, here's the ankle joint, the tail curl joint. That's the relationship between the tib fib and the talus in the foot. And you have ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Uh, in the mid-tarsal joint, uh, that's where the uh, tarsals are hitting the calcaneus or the, the, the talus and the, um, the calcaneus. And you're also getting dorsiflexion there as well. So you're getting two points where you're getting the toes up or toes down. We have... Um, foot inversion and eversion. This is not happening at the tail curl joint. This is actually happening at the subtalar joint and the mid-tarsal joint, and we'll go into details there. But this should be a review. Um, if we're looking here at the um, foot here, here's the left leg, uh, medial. Uh, this, uh, this line here represents midline. So when the foot, the bottom of the foot, the, the plantar surface of the foot is facing in, down and in, that's going to be eversion, and when the uh, foot is uh, facing out, that's going to be eversion. Now, another way of looking at this <coughs> is that if my foot is down, if I fully plantar flex, so I point my toes, and then uh, I look at the axis of rotation. Uh, if I look at here, this is the uh, axis of rotation right here, and my foot's dangling down, and if my foot is in, like it is here in inversion, that would be towards midline, that may be in, interpreted as adduction, right? Kind of going in towards, like same thing if the leg was moving in this way, we'd call that uh, hip adduction. Well, we can look at the foot coming in too, that's foot adduction and foot coming out, foot abduction. And if we look at the next slide here, it kind of shows that this uh, term inversion of the foot and eversion of the foot can also be looked at as adduction and abduction, abduction and abduction. Um, a couple slides coming up here, we'll look at that the coordinate system for the foot is a little bit different than we do for the rest of the body. So when we look at the foot, um, you have ankle motion, about 20 degrees of dorsiflexion, 50 degrees of plantar flexion, um, 10 to 15 degrees of, invers of uh, inversion, a little bit less in eversion. You got your toe flexion, and you have toe ab and adduction. But we're really not going to get into the toe detail so much. We're more interested in this ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, and inversion. And then I want to bring your attention here just for a moment, we'll, we'll circle back to it, is this term pronation and supination. Uh, that is sometimes used in terms of the arch, and we used it last lecture, that pronation is flattening of the arch, uh, flat foot and supination is creating the arch. Um, but what we're going to get into is the arch is really um, formed between the relationship of the rear foot and the forefoot, and that's what either makes an arch flat or make an, uh, makes the arch high. And you kind of see here, um, when we look at the ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, it's not just the tail curl joint that's right here, but it's also the mid-tarsal joint here that's allowing that movement in the foot. Same thing here with plantar flexion. It's not just this joint right here, but you're also getting movement at that. So it's a combined movement of both the ankle and the mid-tarsal joint that's creating dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. This you can visualize the forefoot, and the forefoot here is uh, the metatarsals and the phalanges and you're getting toe flexion, toe extension, abduction, and abduction. So when we look at the cardinal planes, we look at uh, sagittal plane, frontal plane, transverse plane, that three coordinate system, and when we looked at everything else in the body, uh, flexion and extension occurred in the sagittal plane, ab and abduction, the frontal plane, and internal external rotation, transverse plane. The foot also has three coordinate system. It has a sagittal plane, a frontal plane, and transverse plane. But the terminology is different. Although the movements may be the same, like a single axis of rotation, um, but because of the foot is hitting 90 degrees from the rest of the body, we have slight different movements. And I'll show you a couple other slides that the axis of rotation are not quite perpendicular to the planes as well. They come in at an angle. So this kind of creates a com uh, confusion. And then, um, you know, I was kind of showing you in this slide here that the motions are really a combined motion of one, two, three, maybe four joints. So we, we, what we start to do is we start to collectively try to break those down into those uh, components. So um, sagittal plane, as you know from previous lectures, that um, we don't call this flexion and extension of the foot or the ankle. We call that dorsiflexion. That's if the dorsal surface is moving closer 
or the plantar flexion, the plantar uh, surface is moving closer. In the frontal plane, instead of saying ab and abduction, we do use the term inversion and eversion. Um, these are frontal plane motions, just like there would be ab and abduction. And kind of with this slide here, but in call, instead of calling it adduction and abduction, the fact that it's kind of turning in the in the in the transverse plane, um, although it is trans, it's uh, it's it's frontal plane motion, we refer to it as inversion eversion. And then for uh, the transverse plane or horizontal plane, instead of saying internal rotation, external rotation, uh, the term adduction and abduction, more so because there's not an axis of rotation that is tra uh, that is um, that is uh, for, uh, axial like this. There, it's not quite uh, internal external rotation. So just a little change of pace that we're going to be using dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, and adduction and abduction when we try to isolate those particular movements. But in real life, you're not going to isolate um, dorsiflexion, eversion, abduction. What's going to happen uh, is you're going to get a combination of all three movements. So when you are collapsing with gravity, when your body is in shock absorption, uh, being a mobile adapter, your body is not just dorsiflexing, it's not ever, this is kind of like when we introduce the, the scapular movements, that you're not really getting elevation or upward rotation or protraction, you're really getting this com combination of the scapula going up and over or down and back, and the foot is the same aspect, that you're getting these three motions usually happening all at once, and instead of trying to identify that is it dorsiflexion, is it eversion, is it abduction, well, it's a little bit of all three. We just collectively call that pronation. And then when we um, are looking at overcoming gravity, so when the foot's becoming a rigid lever and getting ready to push off for propulsion, um, we look at that not plantar flexion, inversion, and adduction. It's a combination of all three, but we're looking at that and calling that supination. Right, so pronation and supination. Now, instead of talking about the arch being collapsed or arched being uh, accentuated, this is now looking at movements of: Are you pronating with gravity, or are you supinating, overcoming gravity? <coughs> so, again, uh, what we were looking at when we we're looking at foot movement you're not just isolating the tail joint or the subtalar joint or even the mid-tarsal joint or even these interphalange and these other joints here, but when the foot moves, it's a collective movement of all six of these different uh, biomechanical regions. And again, the complexity of the foot, what it needs to do, how fast it needs to be able to, to change, it really is this dance or this orchestration between the rear foot and the forefoot and is happening between these joints here. The other confusing or confounding aspect is that the axes of the rotation are not straight on. So what we're expecting is this nice like quadrant system with these x, y, and z axis and we know that like the axis is perpendicular to this plane and this is there. It doesn't exist in the foot. Uh, it doesn't really exist anywhere in the body but the foot's more complex because you have these interlinked mechanisms. So um, what we're going to show the next couple slides it's going to be um, these three joints, uh, the planes that they actually operate in, and the collective motion, the isolated and the, the compound motions that they actually produce. If you can kind of see here, like here's your here's your tip, your expected y-axis or x-axis and y-axis, and for like the ankle, um, the ankle is supposed to be here, but you can see that it's off by like 15 or 20 degrees. The subtalar joint for that inversion eversion isn't perfect perfectly here. It's off center like this a little bit. And so you're getting a little bit of transverse plane motion as well as uh, frontal plane motion with that foot motion, with that foot activity. So again, just to reiterate, um, the Z axis here, you're getting internal external rotation, which is the same as adduction, abduction um, in this, uh, and that's in the transverse plane, but instead of calling it internal external, like if the tibia turns in there, that's internal external, but the motion that creating at the foot is adduction or abduction. Uh, in this x axis here in the sagittal plane, it's plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. And in the frontal plane, instead of being adduction and abduction, it's inversion, eversion. So I think that would be the biggest takeaway is don't confuse adduction and abduction with uh, frontal plane motion. Um, that is talking about transverse plane motion. And that would be like a nice test question or testable aspect to kind of make sure you know the difference between those two things. Now, um, one of the things you can do this if you're sitting in your chair now, with your knee bent at 90 degrees, go ahead and turn your feet in towards each other. So if you're sitting and you're able to do that, you have done internal tibia rotation. 
and simultaneously you have done um, foot adduction. And then if you turn your feet out, you have done external tibia rotation and um, foot adduction. So that's kind of looking at like how the internal rotation uh, converts into adduction at the foot and how external rotation converts into adduction at the foot. And that's kind of illustrated here with adduction or here with adduction. Gets confusing, right? Trying to figure out abduction or adduction, eversion, inversion, or plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. And that's why this terminology of pronation and supination has become more widespread because it, it indicates what's happening. Instead of trying to isolate, um, let's go back to a slide here, this guy here. Instead of trying to figure out, well, is it the tail curl joint or the subtalar joint or the, or the mid-tarsal joint? The answer is yes, it's happening from all three. It's very hard to isolate these, uh, these three individual motions. It, you, you can kind of sometimes lock the subtalar joint to try to get uh, see if your dorsiflexion is coming from here or there. But unless you're clinically looking at it, it just doesn't happen in, na in nature. So instead of trying to identify dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and all that rigmarole, it's better uh, to kind of look in terms of pronation and supination and use these terms. We're, we're still going to go through and dissect it, but just keep in mind that your foot's either collapsing with gravity or overcoming gravity. So this shows the combined motion. Pronation is uh, inversion, dorsiflexion, and uh, abduction. So if you were to dr try to bring your foot up and out, and then if your foot's down and in, that's going to be supination. So that's going to be inversion, plantar flexion, and uh, abduction, or I'm sorry, adduction, abduction. And this is better depicted here. So if this, is, if this is your right leg and you're going, let's say you're pushing off on your toes, like you're standing up on your tippy toes, that is, um, that is basically supination. So you're doing plantar flexion of the ankle. You're doing adduction because you're going up on the outside of your feet, trying your world, your sh weight shifting a little bit, and you are doing a little bit of inversion. Com uh, conversely, if you're if you if you're standing and you do a um, squat and you cu curl down into a ball, your foot's going to be the way your tibia is going to move. It's going to be up and out for the foot, eversion and abduction. I do want to point out here that um, closed chain, if you remember from our uh, earlier modules means that the distal segment is not free to move, uh, so aka your foot's on the ground. Uh, open chain is your foot is not connected to the ground. Um, not to add another degree of difficulty to this, but the pronation and supination is different whether you're in open chain or closed chain. And I have a couple slides here coming up that, that look at that. So we're going to go joint by joint and look at the axis of the rotation. Um, a little bit more detail than we need, but I think it helps in the understanding of where, where we're at with the foot and the ankle. So we'll start here with the tail curl joint. This is the ankle. Uh, the tibia and the fibula are, are not here, but they would sit right over here on this articular surface. Um, this is the uh, left. This is the, uh, what foot is this? Do, do, do. This is the right foot, and uh, this is where the fibula would be, and this is where the tibia would be on this side. So the fibula would come down on this side, and uh, you would have the left foot way over here on here. So when we look at the ankle, um, when we look at the tail curl joint, uh, that's the relationship of the talus, the bone that's sitting on here, and the tib fib. And as I showed, this blue line here is representing that, that geometric or physics engineering axis of rotation. But you can see that the way that the joint sits here, it's actually off by like between 9 to 12 degrees. And then it's also off in the, uh, so it's kind of down a little bit in the frontal plane. And then when you look above, it's rotated to the right a little bit. So when you do ankle dorsiflexion, if you do it right now, you just put your foot in front of you, and you try to bring your foot all the way up, you're, you would see that your foot actually turns out to the right a little bit, and your toes go up. It's not quite perfect in the sagittal plane. So when you look here, there's the axis of rotation. If you go into dorsiflexion, um, the, you're, you're stabilizing with the rear foot, and you're moving the forefoot. Um, you are picking up movement from the mid-tarsal joint here, but you are really trying to move this, and you're getting somewhere between 10 to 15 degrees here. You get 10, uh, 5 to 10 degrees here, and you're looking at collectively 20 to 25 degrees of dorsiflexion. But you can see that the foot's coming up, and it's coming up and out a little bit, and then in plantar flexion, it's coming down and in a little bit. So that's tail curl, and this is a single joint. It is. It it's only has one degree of freedom. So the ankle um, only comes up and down. It only does dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. There's no other movement that happens at the ankle. All the other foot movements are happening uh, distal to that. So you can kind of see here that, that uh, the Achilles tendon here and the dorsiflexion, you're seeing that sliding and rolling so it stays in place. 
Uh, and when you go into plantar flexion, you're getting some tension on the anterior capsule here in those uh, ligaments. And um, we're looking at dorsiflexion here. In these previous images here, this is open chain, open chain. But where you're really going to experience dorsiflexion is in closed chain. So instead of the foot moving towards the tibia, you're really going to see the tibia moving towards the foot. This is where you're going to be doing most of your analysis. Um, this is where most of the dysfunction is going to come from, where you're going to be working with your clients or patients for proper squatting or uh, normal movement. And you can see here, this is a textbook squat right here, right? And you can see that the, the line right here is, is basically parallel with the line right there. And uh, he's got a nice deep squat, kind of keeping that back nice and uh, rounded, spinal neutral. And you can see how much translation, how far his knee had come over his toes, right? He started here like this. And then as he squ starts to squat down, he's getting ankle dorsiflexion. But instead of the, um, instead of the uh, foot coming towards the shin, it's the shin moving towards the foot. So this is how you're going to experience or you're going to visualize dorsiflexion uh, quite a bit. And dorsiflexion is, dorsal and plantar flexion is, is, a, is, a, is an agonist movement for the squat, right? So it's not just glutes and hamstrings, it's these muscles down here that are working. And uh, when we look at our next slide, <coughs> you'll see that uh, when you initiate the squat, um, your uh, plantar flexors are working to um, bend the knee a little bit, and they are controlling this uh, knee flexion. So your dorsiflexors are kind of pulling forward. And then here, as you come up, your, your, plantar, your plantar flexors uh, are being utilized to... Um, to, they, these are more the agonists in the movement, but they're the ones that are working to pull that leg back because it's a closed chain activity. So you technically are kind of working gastroc and um, soleus when you are, uh, so your calf muscles when you're doing squats, part of that triple extension, um, hip extension, knee extension, and ankle extension, or in this case, plantar flexion. So the next joint we're going to look at is a subtalar joint. Um, this uh, is also one degree of freedom. There's only one um, movement that happens here, and this is the calcaneus moving relative to the talus, and so this is moving back and forth, and they call it pronation supination. It's really inversion, eversion. Um, is the rear foot turning out, or is the rear foot turning in? Because you see from this slide is that it, it almost has a 45 degree angle. So it's not, it, so technically it, it works both in the transverse plane and in the frontal plane. So instead of saying inversion, eversion, because you are getting a, a half of it's really can be de defined as abduction, adduction. The other half is inversion, eversion. Um, and then the other, ha the other part here is it does have this angle here. So it has a little bit of movement in the um, uh, sagittal plane, so dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So it's basically moving through all three planes. Instead of trying to say, is it abduction or is it, you know, what we visually see is inversion, eversion but they really refer to it as pronation and supination because it's a combination of um, ab and abduction, inversion, eversion, and uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. What this looks like in real life is that here's your neutral foot. There's that weird 42 degree angle uh, axis of rotation. And if this is the right leg, and if I um, bring the heel in, you could see technically that we would quickly call this eversion and if we bring the foot in and the bottom of the foot's facing the other foot, um, we would call that inversion. That's the majority of the motion that's happening, but it's eversion with a little bit of abduction and uh, maybe a little bit of dorsiflexion. It does, it's, it's hard to tell between that, but um, this is mostly a frontal plane and transverse plane activity. So um, for the rest of the lecture, when we look at more practical application, I refer to this as inversion, eversion, so like a varus or valgus for the foot, but it's easier just to say, hey, that's turned out, it's eversion, hey, that's turned in, it's inversion, but um, it would be technically pronation and uh, supination. Confusing, right? Just wait. So the third joint here is we have the mid-tarsal joint, and it technically is the articulation between the talus, the calcaneus, and then the cuboid and navicular. But it also kind of extends itself out here. There's also a joint here between the, meta the, the metatarsals and the rest of the tarsals. Um, but uh, they, they're similar in nature. But this really gets the focus here, and it's just generally referred to as the mid-tarsal joint. Now, this one is like a combination of the tail curl joint and the subtalar joint. So the tail curl joint was mostly sagittal plane motion. The subtalar joint was mostly uh, frontal plane and transverse plane. 
Uh, the mid-tarsal joint is all three. It can do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, and it can do inversion, eversion, or pronation and supination like a subtalar joint. So there's two different, uh, deg there's two degrees of freedom. Here you can see in the longitudinal axis where it's gonna do the inversion, eversion. And then here in the um, vertical axis where it's gonna do, uh, or the uh, medial lateral axis where it's gonna do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Has the same weird angle. It's not quite, uh, it's, you know, where we look at the ankle, the uh, ankle's line was more like five degrees like this at the tail curl joint. This one is a little bit more off center, but it can involve in dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. It does all three at this particular joint. So you get your at, at position one and at position one and two, the red dots. Those are the two joints that are making up ankle dorsiflexion. So you're getting most of it. You're getting about half of it here and half of it there, and then you're also getting in, inversion, eversion at the green dots. So you're getting most of it here and you're getting the rest of it there. So this mid-tarsal joint is, or transverse tarsal joint can do both movements. So you're getting dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion. Here you're only getting dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and here you're only getting inversion, eversion. And when you look at the mid-tarsal joint, um, when you stabilize, so what's happening here is this, when you're, if you're clinically doing this, you're stabilizing the rear foot so it can't move, and you're trying to minimize the amount of movement and you're just moving the forefoot, you are trying to isolate dorsiflexion, plantar flexion just at the mid-tarsal joint. If you didn't stabilize this joint and you pushed up this way, you'd be getting dorsiflexion and plantar flexion from both the tail curl joint and the mid-tarsal joint. Same thing with inversion, eversion. If you block the rear foot and you just move the forefoot, you're going to get inversion, eversion of the forefoot. So it'd be the forefoot moving relative to the rear foot. And this is eversion, so the bottom of the foot's, the front of the foot's turning out. And this would be inversion, the front of the foot is turning in. Um, and then when we compare this to the subtalar joint movement, both um, the forefoot and rear foot were coming in for inversion, and the forefoot and the rear foot were going out for eversion. So this is where we introduce this concept that the forefoot can move independently of the rear foot and vice versa. So again, just to kind of review, um, we have the three planes, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Instead of calling this flexion and extension, it's dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Instead of calling this inversion, I'm sorry, uh, abduction, adduction, it's inversion, eversion, and then abduction, adduction is happening in the transverse plane. So no internal, external rotation. Again, pronation and supination. Now I mentioned that um, the pronation and supination are different in open chain and closed chain. So if I'm in this position here with my feet dangling, um, right now, gravity has taken over, and gravity is just pulling this down. And so this is actually plantar flexion with a little bit of inversion and adduction, which is actually the definition for supination. If I, in, if I overcome gravity, you can see that this person's left leg is, is holding this leg up. I'm overcoming gravity by going into dorsiflexion. Now remember, dorsiflexion was part of pronation, which is collapsing with gravity, not part of and this is where it gets a little tricky when you look at open chain or closed chain. We don't, we're not in this position often. Usually our both contact of our feet are on the ground or at least one, and that's where we're pushing off. That's where our torque is coming from. And in open chain, if I grab the rear foot and I do inversion at the subtalar joint, um, the rear foot and the forefoot are going to come along, right? So if this is free to move, if this is open chain and there's no outside force, outside pressure, um, both the forefoot and the rear foot are going to move simultaneously. They're going to do the same thing. The same thing goes for eversion. Uh, if I evert the subtalar joint, so if I take the rear foot and I turn it out, the forefoot is going to follow. So the, uh, the movements are the same, rear foot and forefoot, when the foot is free to move. Conversely, if I take the forefoot and I turn it in and there's no contact here at the ground, um, I'm going to get um, same movements. So in open chain, the forefoot and the rear foot are doing the exact same thing. When this foot hits the ground, everything changes. Everything changes. So in, in open chain, when the foot's free, um, when the foot is dorsiflexing or when the ankle's dorsiflexing, plantar flexing, everting, e inverting, uh, you're getting the same movement all the way through. In closed chain, you can get independent movement and you will get and you need to get independent movement of the rear foot and the forefoot. So what will happen here is in neutral, this is neutral stance, if I evert the um, rear foot, right, if I um, take this foot 
and I, I take the heel and I turn the bottom of the surface out, um, the whole foot wants to come with, right? The whole foot wants to turn out. This is turning out, but this foot is the, the front forefoot's being blocked by the ground. So the forefoot doesn't move, the rear foot moves. And if I freeze that position and bring my foot back to neutral, when I brought this heel out, that would be the equivalent of the foot going in in the inversion. Same thing over here. If I try to invert my rear foot, this foot, this rear, this forefoot wants to come down too, but it's being blocked by the ground, so it can't do that. So if I come back and reassess, um, I'm getting opposite movements. So in closed chain, um, the rear foot and the forefoot are doing opposite movements. So if I'm pronating in the rear foot, I'm supinating in the forefoot. Or if I'm everting in the rear foot, I'm inverting in the, in the forefoot. So it doesn't matter what terms you use, as long as you realize that what the rear foot is doing and the forefoot is doing are opposites. You can say this is moving laterally and this is moving medially. Even though those aren't the right terms, just realize that they are moving opposite. Uh, you, this is, you can depict this, you can see what's happening. Here's the ankle, no movement there, right? This is sagittal plane motion. So here we're looking at frontal plane motion. When this heel is going into inversion, um, this forefoot staying stable, uh, the forefoot is creating the equivalent of eversion. And the same thing over here with the uh, eversion. If the rear foot's everting, the forefoot must be inverting. And this is what that looks like. Um, again, this uh, rear foot, uh, eversion, uh, forefoot in open chain doing the exact same thing. In closed chain, uh, when this is moving in, that foot is, is not free to move, right? Because it would be pushing into the ground. And so your toes are staying flat as your heel moves in. So what that means is, is that this movement is actually happening not just here relative to the forefoot at the mid-tarsal joint, is that you're getting some involvement of the tib-fib up the chain. And that's what you're seeing here is that when you um, do rear foot pronation or rear foot eversion, you're getting forefoot supination, and you can see what's happening here. What this, what this real, real, real device is, this is a Velcro strap, and it's just a pointer sticking out. It started here, and you're actually getting internal rotation as this is happening. And then, if, and then what happens when you do rear foot pronation and the forefoot supination? You're getting collapsing of the arch. You're getting, if you're pronating, through the rear foot, you're pronating up the chain, and you're flattening the foot. And that's where the that's where the term pronation of a flat foot came from. Was it, that's the result of what's happening through the kinetic chain. And inversely, if I do rear foot ever, uh, inversion, so I'm doing supination, um, my forefoot's going to do inversion. It's going to do the opposite, and I'm going to be doing external rotation, and I'm going to give myself an arch. So if you go ahead and stand up right now, go ahead and do it. Give you a second to put your laptop down, but stand up. And if you stand with both feet on your legs, go ahead and roll your feet on the outside and inside. So go on the outside of your feet, inside of your inside of your foot, the instep, outstep. And if try to do that and keep your feet on the ground, if you collapse your arch, if you try to flatten your foot out, what you'll notice is that your knees become knock kneed. You actually get a valgus position in your knees because you are internally rotating and collapsing into each other. What you'll notice is that when you do this, uh, as you uh, flatten out your foot, the back of your heel is trying to turn out and you'll feel pressure of your big toe into the ground. So that's your foot trying to invert. It's trying to, I'm sorry, it's trying to evert, uh, but it can't, and I, I actually, I lied. Uh, you'll actually feel it on the outside of your foot. As you try to collapse your foot down, no, I was right. If you try to collapse your foot down, you're gonna feel the pressure on the instep. Your, fo your forefoot's trying to evert, but it couldn't, and so the big toe, the ball of your foot is stopping you from doing that. Conversely, if you try to turn out, give yourself an arch, give your, give your foot as arch as much as possible, you'll feel your knees turn out, so you're doing external tibia rotation, and you'll feel the pinky side, your fifth toe, trying to push into the ground as you do that, and it can't because it's pushing. So what's happening is when you try to give yourself an arch, you're getting rear foot supination, or the same as inversion. Your forefoot's trying to do that, but it can't because it is uh, being blocked by the ground, and the equivalent joint action is eversion. Now, I wish I was there with you guys to have a foot. I would show this to you. Um, there are a couple videos that I have posted that support that show this, and so it's real. When you can visualize it, it makes a lot more sense. So please look at those videos and go through. Um, I would create a video. I just don't have an anatomical model with me right now to to be able to do that. But um, it will be coming that video. 
So here's a little chart for you to kind of follow. Um, this slide's really busy, so I'm just gonna advance one slide to kind of kick it out a little bit. That in open chain, rear foot and forefoot are doing the exact same thing. So if the rear foot's inverting, so is the forefoot. Um, if the rear foot is inverting, so is the forefoot. In closed chain, when the foot's on the ground, you're getting opposite movements. When the rear foot is everting here, um, it's the equivalent of creating forefoot inversion. And if the rear foot's inverting, it's forefoot eversion. If you're getting rear foot eversion, you're collapsing your arch. If you're getting rear foot inversion, you are creating an arch. And the reason why this mechanism exists is so that you can stand on surfaces like this and your foot can adapt and you can push off and you don't lose your balance and you've lost no performance. So it's the ability for your foot to adapt to different surfaces and then when need be, to be able to push off. It's kind of like the core of your foot, right? It's, in, it's more important than your core because it's your contact to the ground. And all of this mechanism here is all about maintaining this appropriate arch, right? This arch is the shock absorption. The bigger the arch you have, the more range of motion you have until you collapse, and the more time the muscle has chance to uh, do its job. And if the muscles are weak, this connective tissue in here gets beat up and gets inflamed, and that's when you end up with conditions like plantar fasciitis. It's also why you have different arches, right? You have a normal arch or a high arch or a flat arch. This is somewhat structural, but it didn't start that way, right? And you can see what happens here is during a, uh, when you have a normal foot, you have more contact here at the forefoot, a little bit here, and you have less of the midfoot touching the ground. The higher the arch, the less contact you have, and the lower the arch, the more contact you have. And this is all back to this whole spring mechanism of body collapsing with gravity and does the foot mechanism, do the muscles have the ability, the muscles that do inversion, eversion, can the foot appropriately manipulate the forces between the rear foot and the forefoot? If they can, you're gonna end up with a normal arch and you're gonna have nice foot structure and nice foot function and you're not gonna transfer any stresses up the chain. Uh, if you don't and you have weakness here, this thing's gonna be flattened out it's going to collapse and you're going to have issues with um, this connective tissue down here. And again, it all comes back from this aspect of are you supinating when you're supposed to supinate? Can you pronate when you're supposed to pronate? And more importantly, are the muscles that support plantar flexion, adduction, and inversion, do they work? Are they strong? Are they coordinated? And then the same is for pronation. And that's where a lot of the clinical practice, clinical application happens is Let's start strengthening these e extrinsic muscles, intrinsic muscles, um, so that we can start to re regain, go from this flat foot here to this nice, healthy arch, right? And that's definitely doable. If you can train your pecs and train your glutes and train your triceps and train your neck muscles and hand muscles, uh, you can train your foot muscle. But it, it takes some time, and um, it's a process. So um, we'll talk more about the muscles in the next, um, the next lecture. But for now, uh, definitely review uh, Chapter 10. Um, watch those videos, those foot motion videos, watch the subtalar joint. Um, they're not meant to be watched once. You might have stop and replay, but the more you watch it, the, um, the more you're, it's going to set in. And I think if you can visualize that rear foot moving in one direction and forefoot moving the other, um, it will um, uh, solidify for you. So that's... Uh, that's it. I think I have a couple extra... Uh, in the anatomical lower extremity, there exists three cardinal planes. Sagittal... Uh, I had them integrated into the lecture at one point, but um, uh, it's definitely... it's This is like a video within a video. It'd be like Inception. So uh, make sure you watch those videos, and uh, they're, they're right after this video in the Blackboard shell.